welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I wanted to start out with the title of the book, which as a, both a you know, pas person passionate about science, uh, as well as someone who has a, a fond respect for literature. Um, the book is titled Einstein's Greatest Mistake, a Biography. Um, and I couldn't tell by the end of the book whether you had intended for the, the, the mistake or for Einstein to be the subject of the biography. I suppose it's both of them. Uh, I was struck that uh, when I was little and first heard about Einstein, what did I think? He was the smartest man in the world or one of the smartest men in the world. So therefore, everything must have been easy for him. Everything must have been fearless, confident. If he had a decision, he would always make the right decision. But it wasn't like that. He, um, he had flaws. And uh, as a great genius, has really uh, great flaws. So I was struck that, I, what if I told a double story? What if I told the story of, uh, of his science, which is fascinating. It helped shape the modern era. But what if I got to the man behind it? And not in a way to undercut him or just show random things about him. But what if we could bring out the essence of that man and interweave it with the story? That was my goal. And, and I think that comes out um, throughout the text, uh, the, you know, the, the way that you privilege Einstein and, and his relationships, um, but the way that you sort of foreshadow, I think, uh, what ultimately you reveal as his greatest mistake. Um, so, so what is that? Uh, in a short version, sometimes if you've had a, a style or an approach that works, you tend to stick to it. Uh, something that worked really well before, a real success, you sort of lock into it. Uh, Einstein had uh, something similar. He um, uh, will discuss it more, but in 1915, he came up with a magnificent vision of the universe. Um, should I describe it with the trampoline image? Absolutely. Sure. Um, suppose, uh, uh, suppose, and this is how he described all of outer space um, existing. Suppose you have a, a flat trampoline, maybe it's like a rubbery, taut surface, and it's really smooth. Maybe you're in, you're in the United States Marine Corps, and you've had to make your bed really taut and flat. Okay, see it in front of you. Now take a little ball bearing and flick it along. Just flick it in a straight line. It'll just go along that rubbery sheet. It'll just go in straight lines, okay? Now suppose you take something heavy, like a big rock or a small bowling ball, and put it in the middle of that trampoline. It'll kind of sag down there in the middle. Well, if you take a little ball bearing then and flick it along, if it goes near the sag, it'll, whoa, it'll wish around it, kind of like in a pool table or with the British call a billiards table. Anyways, Einstein took that image and he thought, that's what the universe is actually like. If you take the sun and it'll sag down the actual space around it, this is only a metaphor, the reality is more complicated, but very roughly, if you take the sun, like a big rock, put it on a trampoline, space itself sags down around it. And then if you flick something like, maybe not a ball bearing, maybe an entire planet, Earth, goes towards the sun, and why does it curve? Nobody really, really knew until Einstein. The bend in space around it, the sag down, makes this, uh, the entire Earth curve around it. And there's similar sags that all the planets spin like that. Anyways, Einstein took that notion, and he was able from that to say, wow, the amount of sag, the, the distortion of geometry, explains how this happens. It was an incredibly simple vision. Anyways, he came up with that. He was in a despondent state. He had broken up from his first wife. He had met a woman he was interested in. For a second wife, he wasn't sure if she was right. He was in the middle in 1915 in Berlin, in the middle of the First World War. It was hard to get fuel. He didn't have electrical, he didn't have a, a, an electric refrigerator. His first electric refrigerator came in his 40s. He was a man in his 30s and kind of alone in the city. He couldn't bear how this, uh, what he called the political pathology was taking over. He said he felt that the German army was like giving a madman a machine gun, just taking these ma magnificent modern tools and having them used in a terrible way. But he managed to have all that be excluded, to forget all that. And he came up with this wonderful vision. And then two years later, still during the war in 1917, he realized an amazing prediction of it. This vision that I gave of the curves at a heavy weight will make space itself go down and sag. He realized, for reasons I explained in the book, that that predicts that the universe is expanding, that everything's moving apart. So he asked his astronomer friends, is the universe expanding? And they said, nope. To the best knowledge of all the world's astronomers in 1917, the universe was simply our Milky Way galaxy 
with all the stars just hovering in space, and beyond it, there is a void. So Einstein had to modify this beautiful early equation, this lovely vision of a simple sag explaining everything, and he had to put on these ugly modifications, and he didn't like that. The reason he didn't like that is that he had a strong religious vision of how the world should be. Uh, as a little footnote on Einstein's religion, uh, you can say there's a spectrum, say from atheism here to um, uh, uh, believing literally in, say, the Old Testament and New Testament or Quran, whatever, and the traditions over there. Einstein was uh, against atheism. He thought it was very unscientific to be so, uh, so cocky and so sure. He wrote kind of sadly about atheists. He said, oh, they're protesting a little bit too much. Uh, he himself uh, was not, didn't believe in the literal details of uh, many established religions. Um, he thought that uh, uh, there, a man named Moses may have brought down uh, wise commandments to the ancient Hebrews, but that it didn't come from God. So he, didn't, he wasn't over there. He was in this realm in between. Uh, his vision was much like the uh, Dutch philosopher, Jewish philosopher Spinoza from the 1600s, that there's a subtle pattern in the universe. We don't know exactly what it is. We can discern it. We can get little hints. Einstein once said he was like a little boy walking into a library. The room was dark, and on the walls were all these books which had, they actually had the wisdom of the universe written within. There, you couldn't read them most of the time, but very occasionally, the wisest members of our species could walk forward take down just one of the books, open up a page, and you would see things. You would see, you might see E equals MC squared, or you might see the golden rule, the Sermon on the Mount. And you have to close the book, you put it back on the shelf, and you leave. You just had a vision. And that's what Einstein believed. When he came up with a simple vision in 1915 of that sag and the curve, he thought, I've seen it. I've seen one of the truths which was given, maybe not by God himself, but but by whatever forces were behind the universe. And he felt terrible having to desecrate it. So I, I want to interrupt you there sure. just to, to quote you, um, because in your fourth interlude, which I mentioned earlier, the, the book has these four interludes that really weave the narrative together in such a nice way. Um, the analogy you use, it, it's a quote from Einstein, I think, where he says, Mozart's music seemed so pure that it seemed to have been ever present in the universe, waiting to be discovered by the master. And this is exactly what you're talking about, sort of plugging uh, yes. this idea. Mozart, he said, would take lift across a veil, and it was like opening one of those books. Occasionally, listening to Mozart, you feel you've seen something very true and also something very eternal. That's what Einstein felt he had uncovered in 1915. That's what he felt really bad that he had to modify it when people said the universe wasn't expanding. Anyway, in 1929, 1930, Astronomers apologized, oi, they said. They might not have literally said oi. But equivalently, they like, oh, were we wrong? Do we apologize? They found out that indeed, Edwin Hubble and other people, the universe is expanding. Clusters of galaxies are speeding away from each other. Einstein said, I knew it. I knew I was right. I shouldn't have given in. That beautiful vision he had had, that he had reached by pure imagination, which for him revealed the divine hand. He'd been right all along. He'd given in, he'd given in for 10 years because the experimental evidence, but it turned out he should have stuck to his guns. Experimentalists can be wrong. Astronomers had new evidence. Anyway, so that burned him. And after that, so I don't feel the making the changing his equation was a mistake. It's a mistake you can fix. It's not a great mistake, but he drew a psychological conclusion, a dangerous conclusion which is that when something was clear in his head, when he felt he had seen God's hand and it fit the mathematics beautifully, that had to be what things were like. Well, this was exactly the time when quantum mechanics was coming in. But very roughly, quantum mechanics deals with really micro, small, tiny, tiny subatomic uh, events taking place. And in the 1920s, all sorts of evidence was coming in into the 1930s, suggesting that it was a bit like the foam on waves. Instead of the smooth, even swells we see of ocean waves, there's some foam on the top which was intrinsic to reality. If you look really closely, you wouldn't see something clear. You would only be able to, I don't know, tell that there's probabilities or chance. Einstein said, well, that's a very fine first approximation. Our experimentalists are uncovering an interesting new area. They're unable to find the details, and in the future we'll learn more details and see that everything is as clear as these visions I've had before. And many, many physicists went along with him. That was very plausible. 
But as the evidence went on and on to the mid-1920s, late 1920s, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, other things like that, one by one, the uh, uh, physicists who had been on Einstein's, on Einstein's side, they left him. One of them was the Frenchman, um, uh, de Broy. And I met him when I was young and he was old. This happened in the 1920s. But in the 1970s, I was a young man in Paris and I met Mr. de Broy, um, Nobel laureate. And he described the poignancy and the sadness at leaving the great Einstein behind. But he said, de Broy said, the evidence was just clearer and clearer. Everybody, almost everybody, moved over to that side, believing that, yes, Einstein was right about outer space and the clarity you see on the big scale, but he couldn't, he wasn't right about all these things happening on the micro level, that there really is foam and uncertainty and probability down there. Einstein refused to accept it. And the reason is because of what had happened earlier with astronomy. He had been burned once. He wasn't going to be burned again. That's a, an excellent summation of probably one of the most complex topics uh, that, we, that we could start a, an interview with. So thank you. <laughs> but I, I want to follow up a little bit on this. So I, I have a question. You, you've been studying Einstein now. This is your second book, really, about Einstein's work. Um, the first is E equals MC squared. Um, for, first of all, you, can you tell us a little bit about the process of trying to get into the brain of of someone who's noted as you know, a legendary sort of mind and, and what that experience has been like. Uh, to try to uh, explain science in a clear way, it, it helps. Um, first, you, you have to learn the material. And then it tries, it's a, I found it a real pleasure to try to relive it through Einstein's eyes. Try to imagine what was it at a time when people didn't, didn't view it the way he did. I can give an example from a, a, a previous generation. In the uh, mid-1600s, people didn't think that gravity was a universal force. At one point, a, a comet was seen going towards uh, the sun. And many people assumed, later they saw another comet coming out from the other side of the sun. And most people assumed, well, the first one had shot by the sun and kept on going. Um, Isaac Newton thought, wait, maybe it went into the sun and uh, some force pulled it and the new comet that came around the other side was just the same comet. We'd seen it go around. Before his time, there was no such notion. There was no idea that there could be this invisible force pulling it around. Why, just think of like, if I throw a ball, why would I imagine they would be pulled around something and come back? It's hard to get into that mindset of what it was like before gravity. Similarly with Einstein, I tried to get into the mindset of what was it like before? And then I realized I can make this interesting even for non-scientists. Scientists are interested in any way. Ooh, there's geeky, exciting equations. I love <laughs> equations. But um, what if I presented the story, say, not of all of his work, but just of a bit of his work, but just E equals MC squared. What if I presented it as a biography? If there's a biography of something, you wonder, what were its parents like? Where did it come from? What was its birth like? Did it have a difficult adolescence? Did it listen to its teachers? And then what happened when it left the home and went out into the world? And that was a lovely form that I used 15 years ago with my first book on Einstein. And I thought, you know what? It worked then. Let me recycle it. Yeah. <laughs>